If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, if you're new with us, generally what we do here at First Baptist Olo is preach through books of the Bible. Uh, Last week we finished up our journey through Hebrews, uh, finishing that year-long trek through Hebrews out, which was good. And then today, being Father's Day, I'm going to do a standalone sermon, specifically speaking to fathers. And then next week, we're going to start a series through uh, the summer, or through the summer, we're in the summer, through the rest of the summer, uh, called Reset. Just kind of resetting from this COVID stuff and everything that's been going on within our country, which if you're new with us, because of COVID, things look a lot different, not just in our setup here, but uh, in how many songs we sing and what we do as well. And so we'll start that next week. Uh, Pastor Philip will kick that off for us next week, and that'll carry us through the end of July. And then at the beginning of August, we'll start a journey through the book of Philippians. We'll start in Philippians and let that take us as long as it will take us. Who knows? It could be some time. Uh, We are known to spend some time in some books, which is okay. But today we're in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, as most of you are aware, and as I've already mentioned, today is Father's Day. Father's Day is an important day. It is very important for us to make much of our fathers because fathers are extremely important. I think we all would agree with that. Fathers are extremely important. You see, fathers play a vital role in the teaching and upbringing of their children, the shaping of their children, which can be either for the good or for the bad. We probably would all affirm that we've been shaped to the negative and the positive in certain things uh, from even the best of fathers. And many here today would say that they have great fathers, that their fathers are great fathers. Their fathers have been emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually connected to them, raising them in the manner in which the Lord would have fathers to raise their children. And we praise God for those dads. We praise God for godly fathers. However... As I mentioned on Mother's Day, Father's Day can offer its fair share of challenges. It certainly can. First, there may be single men longing to be fathers, longing to be fathers, some of which may remain single through the entirety of their lives. There are other men who are married who long to be fathers, but for whatever reason have not been able to at this point, and it can make today difficult. There are also many who do, not ha- who do not have fond memories of their fathers. Maybe your father abandoned you. As of 2017, 19.7 million children in the U.S. are living in a home without a father. That's no stepfather, no adopted father. That's no father at all. Or maybe you did have a father physically in the home, but he was emotionally, he was mentally, spiritually disconnected from you. Maybe your father hurt you deeply at some point in your life. Or maybe today is difficult because your father's passed away. He's no longer with you, and you can't celebrate with him. Or maybe, adding another uh, different element throughout the pandemic, maybe you're unable to see your father today because of COVID-19. There are many reasons why this Father's Day might be difficult for you. And whatever the difficulty is, might be for you today. I want you to know that God provides grace for you. He provides grace for us. If your earthly father has been a great example for you, has loved you and led you spiritually, this is a grace from our heavenly father toward you. And praise God for that. Or even if your earthly father has not led you spiritually, but he has been present in your life and he has loved you unconditionally, this is also grace from our heavenly father toward you. And if you do not have fond memories of your father, God provides grace for you as well. And so my aim today is to speak directly to fathers. We have a lot of fathers. We have a lot of mothers here. We have a lot of those who will be fathers, those who are grandfathers, grandparents. Now, I know that there's this overarching thought that on Mother's Day, the moms get a sweet and encouraging message makes us feel so good and warm and fuzzy, and I hope it does. And then on Father's Day, we get out this club and beat our dads over the head for how terrible they're doing as fathers. We may have some that are at home right now for that very reason. Going, I'm not doing that again. Well, that's not my intent today. 
nor is that my intent any day to beat our dads over the head. Sometimes they need it, and we'll do that, sure, but that's not my intent today. If you're a dad, if you're a granddad, if you're a spiritual dad, we have those in our church that are spiritual fathers to maybe those that don't have a father, or if you aspire to be a father, what I want to do today is I want to encourage you this morning, and not only not only do I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you. And as I challenge you, you might take that at times to go, well, here comes that club he said he wasn't bringing out. That's not it. It's a challenge. Because I think that as men, we naturally respond to a good challenge. Not saying women don't respond to a challenge. I certainly think they do. But as men, I think we respond to a good challenge, whether it's in sports, whether a board game. I've seen some knockdown, drag out board games. I'm not going to lie. Or whether it's with math problems that challenge you. Not me. I took college algebra three times. Long story. We can talk about it later. I think that we respond as men to challenges. And so I want to challenge you this morning from the Word of God to lead your children to lead your children in the way in which the Lord would have you to lead. And I want to challenge you to follow God's will for you as a father and not let Satan have his way with your kids. Not let Satan have his way with your family. Because living day to day in this country, the stakes are extremely high. The stakes are unbearably high at times. Our kids are influenced now more than ever because of the various media outlets, because of universities and education and other aspects of society that are fighting to draw them into their, their uh, streams of thinking. And so now is the time, dads, granddads, church family, to encourage your dads to stand for Christ and lead their children in his ways. And dads, we can certainly do this by the strength of Christ, and only by the strength of Christ. And so if you would, in honor of the reading of God's word, would you stand as we read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The word of God reads, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God our Father, God, we look to you in this moment as we approach your word, and God, we ask that you would give us understanding that by your spirit you would give us clarity. God, that you would change us. God, as fathers, that we would follow your example and your ways in how we parent our children. God, as a church, that may not, where everyone may not be fathers, God, may we learn how to pray specifically for those who are tasked with leading children. And God, may you be glorified through the preaching of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we get started with this text, I want to begin by noting that this challenge to biblical fatherhood and to be a Christ-centered dad is a challenge that I'm also issuing to myself. And so just recently, just a little transparency, and we'll talk about this in a minute, just recently, I've tried personally to implement certain disciplines within my own family in order to be more efficient in teaching my kids about Christ. And I'll share some of those things with you in a moment. And the reason that I'm doing this in my personal life, and the reason that I'm challenging you to lead your children, is again, because the stakes are so high. The stakes are so high. The stakes are high because eternity is at stake. The stakes are high because the eternal souls of our children are at stake. As fathers, we have been tasked with the spiritual oversight of our children, and to minimize this at any level can have serious consequences. You see, if there's one thing that I know, Satan wants to disciple our kids. Satan wants to disciple our children. Satan wants to teach our children. Consider our current culture. Satan is discipling our kids through social media, through television, through music, through friendship circles, etc. It's everywhere. And really, do parents really know what their kids are doing or looking at on their phones? 
Satan is doing everything in his ability to teach our kids the ways of this world and to keep us fathers from discipling our kids. He's making us busy with work. He's pointing our attention to other things and away from our families. He's diverting our eyes away from Christ and speaking lies to us in hopes that we don't take our jobs as fathers seriously when it comes to discipling our kids. That's what he's doing. And dads, the reality is Satan wants us to fail. He wants you and us to fail as fathers. He wants, us to te- he wants you to teach your kids how to throw a baseball instead of how to follow Christ. He wants us to teach our kids that fishing and hunting on Sunday mornings are way more important than gathering with God's people. He wants us to teach our kids that as long as we say Jesus is Lord with our mouths, whether or not we align our lives with Scripture is irrelevant. And Dad, Satan wants to destroy our families. He wants to destroy our kids, and he wants to destroy our lives. That's who he is. It's what he wants to do to us. And if we're honest, if we look around at the American church and if we look around at the families who call themselves Christians, Satan appears to be winning when it comes to the men in the church. And so the call to us as fathers is extremely important and our kids are deserving of everything that we have. But dads, listen, here's the reality today. This is what we're staking our claim on today. And I want you to hear this and I want you to hear it really well. We do not have to let Satan take our kids and our families. We don't have to. You see, you and I today can take our stand that we will lead our families for the glory of God. We will teach our kids, no matter how old they are, how to love and follow Jesus. We will make right our wrongs. We will ask for forgiveness where forgiveness is needed. And we will love and follow Jesus. And we will point our kids to Jesus and we'll teach them what the Word of God says. And so today, I'm challenging you and I'm challenging myself, dads, to wage war against the enemy and lead your family toward Christ for the glory of God. Now, before we jump into this text, I want to offer a brief word to those who may not be parents or whose parents have, or whose kids have grown and are adults or whatever the case may be. You see, Paul's writing this letter, and the way it is addressed is it's addressed to children. And Paul assumes that children are sitting and listening to the letter be read. He says in the beginning, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. We pulled this verse out at our dinner table this week. It just, circumstances called for it, right? And so he's addressing this letter to children, indicating in the larger congregation that there are children present here hearing this letter read. And so what that means is this instruction is for everyone. Whether you're a parent or not, this instruction is for everyone. If you're single, if you're married with no kids, or your kids have moved out, the kids at your church are on a level your kids as we are the family of God. And so this means that even if they are not our biological kids, we should love the kids in the church. We should pray for them. We should teach them. And we should serve them, all the while recognizing that parents have a unique, special calling to do this. Pray for the fathers within your church. Pray for the mothers within your church and ask God to grant them the grace to consistently lead their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Consistently, that's the hard thing, is it not? To be consistent. And so how do we do that as dads? How can we as dads better lead like God has called us to lead as fathers? That's a good question. You see, if you're like me, You might have heard these things, like I've heard these things, you know, raise your kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I've heard these things for so long, and really coming up and entering into parenthood, never had anyone kind of draw up a plan or point out what this really means. Yeah, I get it, raise your kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, but I need some bullet points under there. I need some practical things. What does that exactly mean? Well, let's first consider this passage primarily looking at verse 4. And so my first and only observation from this passage, that's right, I got one point today. It's going to take up the whole time plus some, so don't get too too excited about one point here. Fathers are to teach their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. One point from verse 4. Fathers are to teach their children 
in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So let's read verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, most of us dads that have been around church for some time are familiar with this command given for us to teach our kids the discipline and instruction of the Lord, but few of us may know exactly what that means or how that plays out. And to be really honest, part of the reason we may not know what that means is because our dads never taught us what it means. And so it just passed on to us. And so from what I've gathered, when fathers fail to lead their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, a good portion of the time, it's because they do not know what that looks like. I get it. I'm supposed to do that. But what does that look like? Well, whether or not you lead your family to love and follow Jesus can have generational impact, a tremendous generational impact. Psalm 145, 4, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall, shall declare your mighty acts. And so if one generation fails to commend the works of God to another, then the next generation will more, more than likely fail to commend the works of God to another. And then you see the cycle. You see the effects generation to generation. And this is often what happens in fatherhood. I know that this is what happened in my own life. And I know that this happens to others. And so it really starts with great-grandparents or grandparents failing to teach their kids how to follow Christ, and then it goes from father to the next generation of children, and down and down it goes. And so if this might be you today, if you go, well, I don't know how to do this because my dad didn't teach me and his dad didn't teach him, and you can chase it down the family lineage as far as you want. If this might be you, it's important today, dads, it's important that you and I today break that cycle. We break that cycle, and we start a new cycle of teaching our kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I've had this very conversation with my own father, and he has said those same words to me, break the cycle. Break the cycle. I didn't, discipline, I didn't teach you discipline uh, and, and instruction of the Lord. My dad didn't teach me that. It's up to you to break the cycle so this doesn't carry on. So, men, it's up to us to break the cycle if that's us. Now, this doesn't just mean hauling your kids to church or telling them to be good people. It involves showing them how to love and follow Jesus. And so what does it mean to teach your kids the discipline and instruction of the Lord? First, it's funny, I keep asking this question, and I don't tell you what it means. Well, first, I'm going to tell you what it doesn't mean <laughs> before I tell you what it means. First, what it doesn't mean, and then we'll consider what it does mean. First, it does not mean just making sure our kids are good moral people. They don't lie. They don't cuss. They say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. That's not what it means. Teaching our kids how to love and follow Jesus is not about being a moral person. Now, we all know that loving and following Jesus involves Christ-like morality. That's for sure. But if morality is the end goal in how we teach our kids, then we're missing the mark when it comes to loving and following Jesus. A lot of good moral people out there that are lost. Further, teaching our kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord does not merely mean making sure they're at church on Sundays. There are many dads who want to make sure their kids are at church without being concerned about shaping them spiritually. And if dads are only making sure their kids are at church, then we are missing a significant portion of our call as fathers. I'm very susceptible to fall into this because we're at church every time the doors are open. So I'm like, as long as my kids are here, I'm good. And so I can fall back on this one real easily. Now, having our kids in church is certainly beneficial as they'll hopefully hear the gospel and engage in Christ-like, Christ-centered relationships. But the church is not the primary disciple-maker of our kids. If we're only relying upon the church to shape our kids spiritually while we forfeit our obligation, then we're also missing it. We're missing the point. We all know people. Maybe we were that person that came to church all of the time but whose parents did not disciple them, and it was not to their benefit when it came to spiritual matters. And so the list could go on and on, but you get the point. So what does it mean to teach our kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? Well, first, Paul says not to provoke them to anger. Do not provoke your ch children to anger. Now, I know we've probably got some teenagers here that just looked at their parents and gave them the stink eye because Daddy took the phone away from them on their way to church or whatever the case may be, and it provoked them to anger. Did you hear that, Daddy? Paul said, you can't provoke me to anger. Well, that's not what Paul means when he says this. I'm sorry. In the ancient world, fathers had absolute control and were sometimes harsh toward their children. Reports show that fathers often sold their kids, could even kill them without face facing any kind of punishment or being charged with a crime. 
And so, kids, if I were you, I would look at my dad right now and give him the biggest hug you've ever given him because he hasn't sold you yet. Or he hasn't followed up on the comment that he often makes, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. Moment of truth, really. Has your mom or dad ever said that to you? Straight up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We probably all fit into that. It's always a funny phrase, by the way. Unless they really follow through, then it's not funny at all. We can, also, we can all agree, though, when we think about anger. He speaks specifically to fathers, but we can agree that a mother could also possess the ability to provoke a child to anger. But given the dominant nature of the father, Paul seems to be alluding to the reality that a father may be more prone to provoking their children to anger. And so a dad needs to be fair. A dad needs to be compassionate. A dad needs to be loving, and a dad needs to have a consistent attitude toward his kids. Again, many of us have heard this before, but what exactly does it mean to not provoke your children to anger? Tony Morita offers some possible causes of angering our children. He says this, failing to take into account the fact that they're kids. That's a really important one. Our kids are not adults. And sometimes we discipline them like we expect them to make adult-like decisions. Comparing them to others can be detrimental for a child. Disciplining them inconsistently. Failing to express approval even at small accomplishments. Failing to express, express our love to them. Disciplining them for reasons other than willful disobedience or, de- or defiance. Pressuring them to pursue our goals, our goals, not their own. What we think they should do, not themselves. And withdrawing love from them or even overprotecting them can provoke them to anger. Now, I think that if we're all honest, because we're all fallen people, we need to go ahead and clear the playing field with that. We are all sinful people. If we're all honest, we have fallen into at least one or more of these categories in parenting our kids. Not just fathers, but mothers as well. We've all fallen into some of these categories. And so what is the natural result of such actions? Will children grow weary or children grow discouraged? Colossians 3.21, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. You see, as dads, we need to be aiming at encouragement, not discouragement. And I challenge all of our dads or those acting as dads to create an environment of encouragement in your homes toward your kids, even in the small things, an environment of encouragement. How much more will our children welcome and thrive when they are encouraged by their dads? So dads, let's create environments of encouragement. I promise you, when Paul says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for it is right, children will much more be likely, be more likely to obey their parents in an encouraging environment. So that's the negative. The negative. Do not provoke your children to anger. Paul then transitions to the positive. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of, of the Lord. So key words, bring up or train, discipline, and instruct. Now instruction carries this idea of teaching, of counsel, of admonition, or warning. Further, while, while discipline does involve punish, punishment, discipline also involves training, training or teaching. You see, think about spiritual disciplines. When we practice spiritual disciplines, reading the Bible, praying, etc., we're training ourselves in the way of the Lord. It's something done for our benefit, whether training or punishment. Think about uh, working out or exercising. You're disciplining your body to respond, to, to grow stronger, to, uh, to run faster, whatever the case may be. And so discipline is something done for our benefit. Now, discipline, again, it can be for training or it can be for punishment. And even in the punishment, it is for training. Hebrews 12, we read that our heavenly father disciplines those whom he loves. And it's the same concept with an earthly father and his children. We are to teach our children Christian instruction and discipline in a way that honors the Lord. And again, dads, this is not primarily the church's responsibility or anyone else's responsibility. It's our responsibility. And obviously, we work alongside of our wives. We work alongside of the children's mother in our, in our own instruction. But we are primary, the primary disciplers in our homes. It's our God-given task. It's what he has given to us. And it's our responsibility to teach them. And again, if we do not, someone else will. 
Satan and the world will teach them. Further, we must be giving our children Jesus. We must be giving our kids Jesus and giving them Christ-centered instruction. Think about this. We spend a lot of time in the car with our kids. If you're like us, man, we live a busy life where you're going from here to there or whatever, all the extracurriculars. As you drive, as you play with your kids, throw on the baseball, whatever the case may be, as you share meals together, talk about Jesus. Talk to your kids about Jesus. Talk about what Jesus did in his life. Talk about his death. Talk about his resurrection. Anytime we have a family meal and we bring up or I open the Bible and we start reading it, Drew's hand goes up, man. And he's got one comment to make, that Jesus died on the cross and raised from the dead. That's his comment. And it's going to come more than once throughout the whole whatever we're doing. We do these things ultimately so that they will, our kids, submit to Jesus. Submit to the Lord Jesus. But in order for us to lead them, dads, in submitting to Christ, we must first submit to Christ. Have a dialogue with your kids. We're good at monologues, right? We're good at talking at them. But have a dialogue with your kids. Have conversation with your kids. Ask them questions. Find out what they believe or what they doubt. Know their fears. Learn their hearts. Speak to their hearts with love, with compassion, and with encouragement. Celebrate successes. Celebrate small victories, whatever they might be. Warn them about the dangers of sin and pray with them regularly. So let's get real for a second. For many of us, it doesn't take us long to admit that we've dropped the ball in leading our families and children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Easy. We could all, a lot of us could say that. Not all of us, praise God, but a lot of us could say that. I think that many of us, myself included, would say that we've wasted some time or that we might could have done a better job up to this point. But dads, granddads, spiritual dads, I want you to listen to me this morning. You can start fresh today. Today is a new day. You can start fresh today. Maybe you're a dad and your kids are now adults. Maybe they have kids of their own. And you look at your family and you readily admit that you've dropped the ball. You carry guilt and shame for how you parented. If that's you, listen, today is a new day. And I want to tell you something. It will speak volumes to your adult children and volumes to your grandchildren if you repent to God, if you go to your children and apologize and you start leading them today even as a grandparent. Speak volumes to them. Even if they're out of the house, you can make wrongs right and start today. You know why? Because there's grace for you. There's grace for you. Maybe your kids are still in the house, but time is passing by. Time is flying at my house, man. I don't know about your house. It is flying. I got seven years left with my oldest. It's not long. You look at your kids, and you'd quickly admit that you've dropped the ball in leading them spiritually. Listen. Today's a new day. Today is a new day. Today is the day you can sit them down for a family meeting and let them know what is about to change. You see, I did this very thing a few weeks ago in my house. In my life, I can make excuses. I make a lot of excuses. I wasn't taught how to disciple my kids from my earthly father. And for too long, I used that excuse when it comes to discipling and leading my own family. Well, I just don't know how to do it. And a few weeks ago, I typed up a list of eight bullet points or disciplines that I was going to start in instituting in my home in order to move us closer to God. You see, I'm a, I'm a visual person. I'm a list guy. Every Monday in this office, I make a list. Boom, 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 boom. And I mark out. I mark out. I have to see it. I'm visual. And I sat my family down at dinner, and I apologized to my kids for not leading them the way that God has called me to lead. And I told them that it was going to change that day. I told them that. And they weren't upset with me. They weren't mad at me. They extended grace to their daddy, who's a sinner. And it did change that day. And I'll say this. 
I've not perfectly fulfilled the task that I typed out even over the last few weeks. I haven't perfectly fulfilled it at all. But my kids don't expect perfection from their daddy. They extend grace to me. Dads, God nor your family expects you to be perfect. God does not expect you to be perfect. They don't expect anybody to be perfect. They just expect you to love and follow Jesus while you lead them to love and follow Jesus imperfectly. And when we prioritize dads, when we prioritize our own walk with Christ, we will prioritize our family's walk with Christ and our kids' walk with Christ. But dads, know this. You need to know this. I need to know this. I need to know this every day when I open my eyes at like 5.30 when Drew wanders into our room. God is for you, dads. God is for you, not against you. God is for your success as a father and for your family and for your kids. He wants you to succeed as a godly father, and he is not waiting for you to slip up so he can condemn you and tell you how bad of a dad you are. He is ready to extend grace to you when you drop the ball. But your kids, the one he has entrusted to you, they need you. They need us to follow Jesus and show them how. And God is for you as a dad. He's for you. You may say, well, how can I institute some things in my home and in my personal life to better enable me to lead them? Well, let's get together and talk. Let's walk through that. We can draw up a battle plan. I told you I'm a visual person to employ, to fight for your family and fight against the enemy who wants to crush your family. You see, this church, First Baptist Olo, values dads, and this church values family. But listen, we don't need to complicate leading our kids. It's not complicated. Discipling our kids does not necessarily mean reading the Bible with them every day for hours. If that's you, awesome. But that's not necessarily what it means. A few things that I've implemented my, out of my bullet points was making sure I pray with my kids at bedtime when I'm able, when I'm there. Making sure I prioritize that. I had the tendency just to kind of brush it off, you know, sit downstairs, wherever the case may be. Making sure that we pray before I leave the house for work when I'm able. Do a short devotion with them at least two times per week, generally at the dinner table when we're done eating. All these things are very, very doable. Now, listen, these devos aren't long. Y'all all know Drew. These things don't last long at all. They're very short. But just making it the priority, talking through a passage of Scripture, a verse, whatever it is, it's something, something. But first, dads, if you want to lead your family to follow Christ, you must first be born again to teach your kids to follow Jesus if you've not turned from your sin and trusted in Christ, I would ask you to do that today because today is the day of salvation. God is holy. God is perfect. God is righteous. Everything that we aren't. God created humanity. Humanity was perfect, and then humanity gave way to temptation and sin. Adam and Eve sinned, and sin entered the world. All of the world, all of the universe has been affected by sin, all of creation. And so we are born dead in our trespasses and sins, unable to know God enemies of God. But God didn't leave us there. Our Heavenly Father, the perfect Father, the only perfect Father, created or sent Jesus Christ to this earth, the eternal Son of God, to die on the cross for our sins in our place, buried in a tomb three days later, raised from the dead. And he says, if you turn from your sin and trust in me, you will be saved. So maybe today, this Father's Day, is the day that you set some new ground rules in your home. Maybe it's the day you set some new spiritual disciplines that will enable spiritual growth, the spiritual growth of your family, of your kids. Whatever needs to be altered, dads, I ask you to do so. Elise Fitzpatrick wrote this. I think this is good. Talking about Paul, the writer of Ephesians. The obvious difference between Paul and us is that Paul bragged about his weakness his weaknesses, and we try to hide it. The obvious difference between Paul and us is that Paul bragged about his weaknesses, and we try to hide it, hide them. Dads, do not hide your weaknesses. 
Admit your weaknesses. Go to God for help. His strength will be sufficient. Because here's what I know, both moms and dads. Weak parents, because we all are, weak parents have a mighty Savior. Weak parents have a mighty Savior. Well, it has been so good to see everyone today. Happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. Uh, We are grateful to God for you, and I hope and trust and pray that you daily uh, lean into Christ and rely upon his strength uh, to shepherd your kids and your family because that's all we have. Uh, Speaking of Father's Day, Pastor Philip is in Texas with his father, so that's why he's not standing here right now. Uh, Next week, we will begin uh, going through our Reset series, uh, and so you'll have an opportunity to hear from Philip and Joseph throughout that series uh, as we walk through that. Looking forward to that, and then we'll start Philippians in August. Uh, We're still walking through developing our Phase 2 type plan to uh, move back into some more normalcy as a church, I guess you would say, and so be praying for us as we do that. Uh, We're glad Emily Cade is home. Emily spent the last year in Mexico training to be a church planner overseas, and so uh, she has finished that program and is back now, uh, and we'll be beginning the process of figuring out what that next step is, and so we'll get a chance to hear from her as a church and pray for her uh, through the process of that. Uh, as well. Uh, One good thing about living in this community is that we have many a folk that uh, plant massive gardens, so much so that they can't eat all of the harvest of which the Lord grants them, and in their great generosity, they pay it forward. And so there is lots of corn. You may walk in going, "Eh, what's this redneck church out here got corn at the front of their church, you know? There's lots of corn out there and back here that I was told by Danny Altman, take it. So if you want to cook cook some corn for Father's Day, uh, it needs to get out of here because if it doesn't, it'll be here tomorrow, and then I'll be forced to take it and figure something out to do with it. So uh, make sure you grab some ears on the way out. Well, let me pray for us, and then we will be dismissed. Remember, when we leave, we want to leave quickly but slowly. All right, maintain your space, Uh, visit with each other, but visit outside so that we can try to maintain uh, uh, the safe environment. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for our fathers. Thank you for an opportunity to worship you and look to your word. God, grant us grace as we go and peace as we go on throughout this day and the rest of this week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Love you guys.